Yes. Okay, cool. So <laughs> once again for the recording, uh, welcome to the computer vision study group in August. Today we will talk about segment anything. So that's a paper probably a lot of people have heard about because it just made some waves when it came out and it only came out in April. For me, it, it felt like, oh, it's been there for so long, but oh, it's four months, which maybe in machine learning time is long. Um, but yeah, came out in April from Meta AI. Um, and yeah, as always, I'd like to put a little theme to my presentations and start with an intro story. So I, I like to come up with some stories um, that are more or less related to the topic. And yeah, today's theme is, oh, I think it uh, kind of neon, neon punk um, ninja style, I would say. And yeah, we start with the story and then we dive into the paper. So it is a warm summer night in Sex City where the buildings grow high and the streets never sleep. Uh, for the story, I created some images, as you see, uh, with generative AI, of course, I used the stable or the SDXL model. So the new one from Stability AI, it is pretty good. <laughs> um, yeah, and we go on with the story. So for months now, clan wars have been shaking the city every day. Three big families are competing for supremacy. The micro clan, having found new strengths, new allies, and new ideas, they want to rule the city. The Elguk clan, having been ahead of the other for a long time, the things are changing recently. The Meta clan, it has seen better days with more money. Nevertheless, they keep coming up with innovations. A key concept in Sex City's urban warfare is hide and attack, for which all clans have their own ninja forces. To avoid these sneak attacks, the clans introduce special forces to monitor and segment the environment. The segmentation measures were good, but rather limited until recently, when the Meta clan introduced Sam. <laughs> She is the result of many months of training in Meta's special program to segment anything. Her abilities allowed her to do the work of many different segmenters by herself. But even more importantly, she was able to pass on her skills and enable others to achieve great things. The streets of Sex City still are a battlefield. Sam won't be able to change that, but her power and her disciples are to have a big impact in this city. And that's it. <laughs> that's the end of the story. It was a rather short story this time, um, because I focus a bit more on like this, this paper part, because I feel like there's so much stuff in the paper. Actually, it could have been two papers. Um, yeah, because in this paper, you not only have this model, like the segment anything model, but also they describe the whole data set and how they made the data set and everything. Um, I think a lot of researchers would have just really made it into two papers because you could easily do that. Um, but yeah, they decided not to. So they have a long appendix <laughs> and yeah, uh, a lot of information in their paper. But here in the presentation today, I will try to focus on, on the model a bit more than on like the data set. Mm, yeah, because I mean, the data set is interesting, very interesting, um, but the model is harder to understand, I would say. And and yeah, I think that's what, what we're trying to do here in the CV study group is mainly understanding stuff. Um, and if you feel like it, you can always have a look at most data set statistics yourself, like where are all the images from or in which countries or whatever. Um, so yeah. Okay, I've talked a bit about the paper already. Um, so let's first have a look actually at image segmentation, right? So what, what is like image segmentation? Um, 
so for me when i hear image segmentation there's always stuff that, like this that comes to my mind so we have like an an original image over here uh and then we have a segmentation map and in the segmentation map you can see different colors right and in this case it's like a semantic segmentation map so you have um, things that are the same class basically in the same color for example the cars are this greenish and the crown is somewhat I don't know what you call it, turquoise, turquoise maybe. And the buildings are pink and the sky is red, right? So it's like a semantic segmentation map. Um, so for me, that's yeah, like the, the most natural thing when I think about image segmentation. Then you often see this as overlays as well, right? Like here, and you can see, aha, uh -huh, okay, here we have our cars and there's the sky. Um, yeah, but actually there are like different kinds of image segmentation, right? So what I talked about now already is this semantic segmentation where we have like, yeah, these um, parts segmented by the classes they belong to. And the important thing about semantic segmentation is that like the whole image is covered. So every pixel has some value assigned, right? So there's no pixel that is like, yeah, well, nothing. So everything is something <laughs> because in contrast to that there is instance segmentation where you don't need to have the whole image assigned somehow and we actually focus more on instances of objects right for example here again the cars right so every car has a different color and we, we don't care about buildings about the ground or about the sky um, in instance segmentation it's really about finding single instances of things. And then there's a panoptic segmentation. Um, actually, for a long time, I thought this was called instance semantic segmentation, but I learned it's panoptic segmentation, which is just really a combination of, of both. Um, where we try to cover, or where we do cover the whole image, uh, but we try to detect or segment as many instances as possible of these different classes we have, All right? So panoptic segmentation is just really the combination of the former two. And yeah, maybe the most helpful, but can also be the most difficult to, uh, yeah, to get to actually. So yeah, one big problem now is like, what if you want to detect new classes? for segmentation, right? Or segment new classes. It should actually be, for example, like signs or billboards or something like that. So what we will have to do is annotate it, right? So we have to go to our data sets and then we have to get up our labeling tool, probably uh, sit in front of our computer or whatever, and then start labeling these pixels. Because it's like the hardest part, I think for segmentation, data sets is, is really just labeling everything because it's, it's, it's like this dense task where we really yeah, care about each pixel, right? Like for object detection, often you just have bounding boxes. So you draw a bounding box here, bounding box there, bounding box there, and it's all good. But for these pixel stuff, you even want yeah the best accuracy actually, right? Because then you feel like, okay, your model can learn best when it's like best accuracy. So it's a lot of work to actually create a data set for semantic segmentation. Um, so the question may arise, okay, there's so much work, so much money that goes into it in the end. Isn't there like a better way? So are there solutions? Um, <laughs> and actually this slide mainly exists because of the image. Um, the image kind of happened when I played around with SDXL model and was, okay, it's so cool. It just has to be in the presentation. So yeah, solutions, question mark. And one solution that comes to mind um, is the so-called zero-shot image segmentation, right? So what we do here is like we have an image and then we just say billboard signs and the model we give this prompt to basically. So this is like our text prompt, right? Billboard signs. And the model can give us the mask with the billboards and signs without 
any further or additional uh, training data. So that's what zero shot means, right? So basically, we think it has never seen billboards or signs. Um, and then, yeah, it can segment it anyway because it has learned so much about like the nature of it. Um, yeah, that it can just do it. That's a zero shot image segmentation. And that what makes um, Sam so outstanding because it is a way to, yeah, leverage zero shot image segmentation with prompts. And what these prompts can be and the whole architecture is the next slide. Oh, wasn't, yeah. So let's have a look at like, how can Sam do this whole thing? How do they get to these zero shot capabilities and how can they do that? So at the start of the whole architecture, there's an image encoder, right? There, you give your image in there and it gives you a representation of the image so tokens, embeddings, whatever you want to call it. And this is only done once. So for example, when you're in their official tool or whatever on their project page and you upload an image, then they do this once, this image encoder thing, right? They just get your image, send it to the encoder, and then they save the embeddings um, for further stuff. So not every time you, you're trying to segment something in the image, they do the image encoding step again, that is only done once right in the beginning. And then the, the embeddings are there because your image does not change unless you upload a new one, right? Uh, so the next step would be that we can add a mask as a prompt, actually. So the mask goes through some convolutional layers uh, to get it in the same dimensions as the image embeddings. And then it just gets added, basically. But there are other prompts we can use as well. So we can just put in points, right? You can say, okay, you want here, here, here. Or we can just use a bounding box as a prompt or a text. And then those go through a prompt encoder, actually. And then the prompt encoder embeddings or the prompt embeddings are then fed to a mask decoder where also the image embeddings and the mask, if it exists, um, go in. Okay, and in the end, we get a mask out, right? So that's like the architecture. Now you might wonder, like me, <laughs> okay, that's good, but what's, what is in the prompt encoder and the mask decoder and maybe even the image encoder, right? Um, and I have to say the paper in the main part is a bit short on that. So they put most of the explanation in the appendix, probably to have more space in the main part for data set stuff. But yeah, if, if you want to read about that, you have to go to the appendix and I did that, <laughs> right? So um, let's have a look and start with the image encoder because it is actually at the start and the symbols one of the encoder decoder things here. So yeah. For the image encoder, of course, we have an image, right? And we give that to a pre-trained um, vision transformer. They say they use one uh, that is trained with a um, mask auto encoder stuff. <laughs> so the, the my, which basically just helps um, getting a better quality, even with fewer images. And then they get the, output of that and feed it into some convolutional networks to in the end get to the embeddings they want. So yeah, it's not much magic in there. So the bit, that's actually the, the compute heaviest part, I would even say in the architecture is this, this image thing here, because what they also say, like in their architecture, they focus on, uh, on, on speed mainly so that this whole SAM the segment, anything model can even run in in a browser and that's why they say, okay, this, this first part, yeah, that's a bit compute heavy, but we only do it once and then um, you can prompt whatever. So yeah, here we get our image embeddings. And the next step is the prompt encoder, which is a bit more complicated. Um, and I have to, had to <laughs> read it a few times actually to really like understand it. 
Um, and I'm still not sure if I completely understood it, even after looking at code and everything. Um, because it was it is a bit strange at points. So here I say it's, it's sparse prompt encoder because they say, okay, these are the, the sparse prompts. And when you put it in a mask, it's a dense prompt. Um, so this is the sparse prompt encoder, basically. Um, and we start with like these points up here and uh, the bounding boxes. And they get fed into, oh, not they get fed into, but um, we first create positional embeddings from them, right? So we get our points, which are somewhere in our coordinate frame in the original image. And from the bounding boxes, we take the upper left and lower right corner and we create the positional embeddings from them. It's actually the absolute sinusoidal uh, positional embeddings. If you know <laughs> some stuff about position embeddings, I don't know too much about it. But um, yeah, they are absolute sinusoidal position embeddings here. They are creating. And then we take these embeddings, like here are our position embeddings, these ones, like the four ones from the four points. And then depending on where the point is, um, we add to it a background or a foreground token, like learnable embeddings as well here. Um, yeah, so background tokens get added to the point that are not part of the ground rules, but are part of the prediction, right? So basically false positives. And foreground ones are the ones where the ground rules and the prediction overlap. So true positives, right? False positive, true positive. OK. For the bounding box, it's a bit simpler. Um, just get there one le for top left and one for lower right that you add as well. Like these are separate position embeddings. You add them. And for the text encoder, they just take the clip text encoder actually. So clip is another model, a multimodal model that exists that has a text and an image encoder. And they just say, oh yeah, we just use uh, basically the clip text encoder and send our text in there. And in the end, what we get are our prompt tokens or prompt embeddings out here, right? So maybe to say it now, <laughs> this, whole, this whole part with the, the text is a bit strange because they talk about it a lot in the paper. But in the released version, there's no, no hint of it, right? So they say, yeah, yeah, OK, for the text, you can do it like this and that. And um, it even needs a bit of a different training strategy. Um, but yeah, they never really released something that can use text out of the box. So there are, there are some more projects that can do that. But from Meta themselves, there's to this date no model that can just take text in. So basically, the prompts are mostly um, points or boxes. Yep. OK, so that was the prompt encoder. Now we get to the mask decoder, which is, I feel like, the most complicated thing. And you can see here we have our image embeddings, right? the green ones. If you remember, green is image embeddings. Then we have our token embeddings down here, the blue ones. And what we do is we add another token which is this purple one, and that is a class token. So if you're familiar with transformers and stuff like BERT or like in general, class tokens are often used to, yeah, to be the output in the end, right? So when you want to classify something with a bit or whatever, usually in the end you get the class token out and then you can say, okay, this is like a duck or a cat. Um, and it's similar here because the class token in the end is used uh, to really create the mask and yeah, so basically it's, it's the mask output token, you could say. Okay. And all these, well, here five tokens, you could say the number can be different, right? Depending on how many prompts you have. Like if you use six, uh, points as prompts, you have like six of these and yeah, so you first feed these prompt tokens here into the decoder block. And the first step is a self-attention. So basically, uh, yeah, it just helps in, in getting these 
tokens more context aware about each other. And the next step is a cross attention, where the goal is to actually help the these tokens and the prom tokens become more aware of the image embeddings, right? So basically, yeah, in the paper they they write it as yeah cross attention from prompt tokens to image embeddings. That's why I put this arrow here. Um, but maybe <laughs> I I was thinking about it the other way because actually the the image embeddings teach the prompt embeddings about their information, right? Oh, next step is that we feed our prompt tokens into a multi-layer perceptron thingy just for some dimensionality things. And then in the last step of the decoder block, we actually go the other way around with the cross attention so that um, the image tokens get some information from the prompt tokens. All right, so this way we have like a yeah, two-way cross attention. Here's a, well, two times one way you could say. Um, yeah, once in this direction, once in this direction. So in the end, these tokens are somewhat connected and know about the information from the other tokens. And we do this decoder block just two times, so it just has like two layers. Uh, quite a small decoder, but as uh, I already mentioned, they try to focus on speed, and that yeah, that helps just having two layers. Okay, then uh, so after these two layers, they take the image embeddings and feed them through some convolutions to upscale them a bit again, because they were downscaled in the image encoder, and now they want to upscale it again. They use some convolutions for it, um, and then again. They have a cross attention here, where for the last time, basically, the uh, prompt tokens learn a bit about the image tokens. And then the class token, which I talked about before, right, gets fed to a multi layer perceptron again. And then the output from here goes here. And with a dot product, you combine the image embeddings and the output mask embeddings, basically. And then you get your mask out. That, that's the mask decoder. It's a bit of a long way in the end. Um, and <laughs> you might have some questions. Uh, I understand that's something I had to look at a long time and always go to the paper and try to try to figure it out myself. And yeah, it's just well, not that easy, but also not that highly complicated, I would say. But now there's one problem actually with masks where they say in the paper, okay, um, yeah, that's what happens when you use point prompts and that's mask ambiguity. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, that means that when I put a prompt point here, right, on, on this cap, um, what do I mean? What do I want to get out as a mask, as a human, right? What what was my intention of getting? Do I want like only this this cap here, or do I want to get the whole tire, or wheel, or do I want to get the whole car, right? And and that's a problem um, that they were facing apparently, especially during validation, I guess, because I mean I could mean all three of these things, right? So most likely for me would be not the whole car. Maybe the whole wheel, probably the whole wheel. Um, but yeah, this mask ambiguity thing is something they tackled by going to the mask decoder again, right? You see here our class token, and they actually use three class tokens here. Okay, so they they not just have like one output mask, but they say, okay, we just take three output masks and. So three was like the, the sweet spot for them. They tried different numbers and yeah, they say, okay, three mostly is, is the best thing um, because then you have like sub part, part and whole or something, as you can also see here, right? Like this would be like sub part, part and whole. Uh, yeah, and that's covered with these three output tokens. So in the end, um, these things here, R3, 
tokens, right? And then you get masks out and not just a mask. Um, and what they also do is that they have another token in here that is just used in the end to give us the intersection over union um, scores of these masks that we then get out in the end here. Um, yeah. And why they need these scores, I will tell you later. That's some, especially for validation and testing stuff. Uh, okay, but that is like the image of the mask decoder. What you see here now is like the, the whole mask decoder. And yeah, let's jump to the next one, which is the training procedure, right? Because you might ask yourself, okay, how the hell do they train this now? Um, I mean, the task they are tackling, they call it prompt-based segmentation. So, of course, the first thing is you need the ground truth, the ground truth mask, for example, for this car here. Then you need a prompt. The prompt is this point. And then you get a prediction, right? Ground truth, prediction. Okay, so now you have these two things, ground truth and prediction. And you can take both of them and create the intersection over union, right? That is like the, uh, yeah, the base uh, metric for most segmentation tasks. So you have like the overlap of both of these masks and the union of both of these masks, right? So like the whole thing they cover, if you just yeah, put them on top of each other, you get like the union and the overlap is the area that is present in, in both of these masks. And with this over section over union, they then use two losses, actually the focal loss and a dice loss, which is also F1 loss, dice and F1. I learned are the same. I hope I learned it correctly. Um, yeah, and oh, it is really similar to in this, this simple intersection over union, but oh, a bit different. <laughs> Um, and the focal loss mainly helps us focus on uh, hard examples, right? Stuff where, where it fails uh, bigger or <laughs> more often. And then they combine these two losses uh, linear, linearly in the end. Um, and they say they have it in a ratio of 20 to 1. So they put some, some weights on it. Yeah. And it's just so the focal loss is way more important than the dice loss in the end for their training. Okay, so that is what they do in, in one iteration, basically, when they prompted it. But there's more because <laughs> they prompted a bit more often, right? So for each mask, they say like, okay, uh, we did the first one, the initial one, and then we do eight more of these prompts in the areas where it is quite uncertain, right? Or where it's wrong, or where it's uncertain. So we, we put some more prompts there. So that, that's eight more. So in total, you could say there's, there's nine prompts now. And then they are also saying, we find out it helps if we just run it two times without adding any any prompt. So they just keep it at like seven points, prompt it again, and then they add another point. Um, yeah. And they say, yeah, this keeping the, the same amount of prompts is, um, mainly helping when you do it in the end once and somewhere in between. Somewhere in between doesn't really matter, apparently, when you do it, but the one in the end does matter for some reason. <laughs> There's always these experiments I find quite interesting, like how did they find that out? How, how many times did they experiment with that, right? But yeah, so that's um, kind of what they say is helping. So in the end, you have, um, 11 times that you go through the whole loss thing. And every time you actually get out three masks, right? As I showed before for this ambiguity problem. And they only back propagate the loss for the, like, the, the smallest intersection over union, right? So they don't do it for all three masks, but they just take like the, the smallest intersection over union. So the mask it does best and they use that uh, for back propagation then. Yeah. Okay, that's how they train it, basically. And here are some results of it. So they did 
validated on 23 data sets and they mainly compared it here to this other model, this RITM model that is also doing like prompt or like point based uh, segmenting. And here they say, okay, they used one center point here. That means they just took like the center of the ground truth mask and then they use that for prompting their model and they are doing really well on a lot of um, these data sets. So mostly better than the ITM model, but there are also some where they do worse. And they also introduce this Oracle thing here. Um, so they say, yeah, we also have our <laughs> Oracle prompt. Here's also some Oracle and Oracle here also is like these dots, right? These, these dashed lines. And the Oracle is when they're actually looking at their intersection over union scores and take the best mask, um, yeah, the best mask according to this intersection over union scores. Because apparently sometimes when you prompt the model, it does not automatically give you like the best mask that would fit the ground truth, right? Again, this ambiguity problem that you can get any of these three where the model things are is actually the best one right now. But then when you go back and compare it to the ground truth, it was not the best of the three masks. So for this Oracle, they say, okay, we actually take what would be the best of the three masks. So it's a bit of, well, <laughs> I don't know if you can call it cheating, but it's, um, yeah, like they say, okay, if we would take the best of these masks, then we would be here, 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 and here, right? Then they would always be better. But um, in reality, they are not. <laughs> so yeah, they just wanted to prove, I think that they can be better than the other thing. Uh, um, what's interesting is here that they say, okay, that's like the, the machine, the automatic validation, but we also want to let humans rate it, right? So let humans have a look at it. And there they say, okay, uh, when humans look at our mask, we are always better than the RITM um, for these data sets here. Uh, yeah. And down here, what we have here, I hear there are more uh, models actually, the simple click and focal click, which get better when they have more points. So the simple click and focal click are not designed to be like one point segmenters, but they're more yeah, focused on having more points to help them segment. And uh, here they also say, okay, SAM is way better when we do it like with just a few points. Um, in the end, when there are more points, then the other ones are pretty good as well. All right. Oh. And here, oh yeah, here's the center point. So always pointed out in the center and uh, random points are yeah. similar. Okay. So that's like the segment anything model uh, with results. And now we have a short look on the data set stuff. Because as I said, they also released the data set, right? With the whole segment anything model. And they have this data set with like 11 million images with 1.1 billion masks. It's a really a big data set. And they also talk about how they collected that actually. So they used three stages. The first one is the assisted manual stage, the second one, the semi-automatic stage, and the third one, the fully automatic stage. So at the first stage, we we'll just go through the stages now because I think that's pretty interesting um, because labeling stuff or even using SAM to label your own data is like one of the main yeah main things I would see uh, use for SAM actually in, in labeling my data or my company's data right just making it easier for me and not having to sit in front of the computer for like weeks just to get some segmentation data. So how they did it, how they created this huge data set for them is um, in the first stage, they have this model assisted thing. So they have an image, uh, they give that to a human. The human says, okay, here I, I put some prompts in, I put here, 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 here. Um, there should be some, some object, right? Uh, and then give that to the, the first version basically of, of the SAM model. And SAM gives us some some masks, 
you give that back to the human, the human can say, okay, um, I refine this mask here and this mask here and this mask there. Uh, and then add that to the annotate data set. And then from time to time, they retrain Sam on this data set, even still in, in this first stage of model assisted manual thingy, they retrain it somewhere in between. I think they don't say how long the, the stages lasted, but I can imagine this stage was like the longest stage because it has a lot of human interaction. Um, and yeah, it probably takes some time. So they just yeah, retrain Sam to get better results in between. So the second stage uh, is a semi-automatic stage. So we still have a human, we have an image and we give the image again to a Sam model. And then what they did is that they used like the data from the last stage and trained an object detection model on this data already. And then they use this object detection model to create prompts for Sam in this stage. So to get better initial results, basically, without a human having to prompt anything. Uh, so then, yeah, you get this mask again, give this to a human. Human says, ah, OK, here you can do better there and there and there. And then again, you have the annotate data set. And then from time to time, they retrain um, the Sam model, right? So yeah, pretty similar actually, just less human interaction. And in the last stage, the fully automatic stage, um, there's no human anymore <laughs> because they said like, yeah, at this point we had a lot of stuff figured out like the mask uh, ambiguity thing. And then we got way better actually and uh, we didn't need a human anymore. So they just take um, the image, give it, to, give it to the Sam model again then they create a grid of 32 times 32 um, dots to prompt it, right? And then they get a lot of masks out of it. And then they have like these, these three key concepts for masks uh, to keep them or to dismiss them. And there's like confidence, stability, and non-maximum suppression. And with this, these three concepts, in the end, they get their fully annotated, or fully, but yeah, the annotated data set, uh, yeah, which in the end has 11 million images and 1.1 billion masks, which is a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. But one thing maybe about the whole data set creation and everything, what bothers me about the paper is a bit, so they do their best to talk about bit about ethics and like responsible AI in terms of, hey, so we created our data set and we checked the biases. So they try to include a lot of images from a lot of different settings and countries and so forth. Um, but I really wonder about actually the humans that were in involved in this whole data creation thing, right? Because they never talk about like the humans <laughs> that are, uh, used here, um, yeah. I'm also a bit concerned about this, like low wage, uh, yeah, data annotating people. So that's something I would have wished some information on from Meta, but maybe well, they didn't want to put it in there. I don't know. Yeah, that's just my my little critic about this data set stuff. So right in the beginning in the story, I already mentioned that um, like one big advantage of SAM is that it actually can help other projects, right, to grow. And it was amazing to see like right after it came out, there were so many ideas from people and, and many things that happened. And I just put in um, two GitHub resources here, basically. They are pretty similar. So when you open it, I open it somewhere or not. Um, you will just get to get a page. Oh yeah, now I, now I opened it four times, of course. And there's just a long list of projects that are leveraging the SAM model in some way, right? So if my computer is not dying now, I can show you. Ah, here we go. So it's called Awesome Segment Anything. 
actually there are a lot of repos that are called something with awesome segment anything or awesome segment i don't know um but yeah this is one of the ones with the most stars so i just chose that one and yeah you can see there's a lot of stuff in here like a base papers base model papers so that's basically papers that are good to understand as well for the segment anything part um derivative papers and image mapping reporting projects yeah that's where i wanted to go right so i think one of the best projects actually is grounded segment anything here because that actually yeah lets you use text prompts um so when you yeah want to use really like these text prompts that they promise in the paper but they don't deliver in the code then the crowned segment anything is, is a good thing to go to because it can do that and yeah it's basically using this crowning dino thing together with segment anything and then it yeah is pretty good i have to say but there are other projects um there's stuff like this magic copy, which is a Chrome extension that lets you just do the foreground, background segmentation pretty well. And yeah, there's also mobile SAM somewhere and fast SAM, which try to shrink the whole thing even more so you can use it on uh, less powerful devices. But yeah, you can just scroll through that yourself if you want to. Um, but yeah, if you want to use it in code yourself, right? Segment anything. It's also available in the Transformers library from Hugging Face, right? So as we are on Hugging Face Discord here, I suppose everyone knows Hugging Face. Um, yeah, and I just linked the official docs here, and there's also some example notebooks from Niels over here, where you can see how to use it. So he has two. One is like fine tune. Sam on a custom data set, and one is to run the inference with met Sam, which is a derivative of the original Sam model. And you can have a short look at that just to give you a feeling of how to maybe use the Sam model with Transformers library. So we yeah, import everything torch and Transformers, so you can import the Sam model and the Sam processor, and then we instantiate both of them. Here um, we give like the hugging face up for the model uh, the the address. This is Wenglab Metsam with base. Okay, so it's the Metsam, not the original Sam. And then you can load a data set, for example, the breast cancer data set here from Niels. And yeah, you can take any image out of the data set. So here he, he takes this image, he loads the image, loads the the crown truth mask basically so you can see it here and yeah in the next steps um he creates a box prompt, box prompt. Hello, can you hear me? oh yeah i can hear now yeah uh sorry i can't see your screen oh wait a second here it is right can you see it now uh yeah yep. no it's good. good thank you Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for telling me. Um, yeah, so you get actually the, the crown truth thing here. And from this crown truth mask, he creates a, a box prompt. So he just adds some, some noise basically to it to not have like it really close, but have like a bit of space around. He uses rent int, right? So he yeah, just creates a, the box around it. And then use it as, uses this one as input box for the SAM model. So you can see the box, right? It's a bit bigger than the original thing, actually. And then, yeah, you can use this, uh, you can call the processor, put the image in and the input boxes. And yeah, in the end, you can get it out again and visualize. So it's actually, <laughs> I, I feel like the, the actual part of the model is, is quite small, but there's a lot of things to do around, like yeah, creating the box. And I mean, up here, Niels just did a lot of code for uh, making it, it visible, like the image and the ground truth mask. So um, in total, the code is quite 
small that you really really need when you don't want to visualize everything right just when you want to make it as visual as uh, Niels here well it gets a bit longer but yeah I would say, say absolutely feel free to check out his notebooks they are pretty good also the one for like the custom data set training um, which might also be really interesting for a lot of people but it's even longer so I don't want to go <laughs> through it all here yeah so that is it for now I would say wait I have some thank you slide here thank you uh, yeah do you have any questions right now uh, I have one question uh, so uh, it's about fine-tuning SAM the the SAM model was trained with uh, prompts or boxes and um, and the losses mm -hmm. but uh, we need the prompt so uh, in case of fine tuning do we need to like for example meta manually uh, label the the pieces we want in the image um what do you exactly mean by the pieces do you mean the, the segments or Yes, for, for example, uh, you need, for example, to, to point the foreground, background, or boxes. And do we need, for example, if we have an X-ray, uh, like a kidney, we have to box the kidney to and then do the, the training loop? Mm, okay. Or something else? <laughs> so, so now we do actually have a look at this fine-tuning data set. Because I have to say that's one thing I, I didn't look into myself very deeply. But maybe we can do it together now. Because, I mean, we have the thing here anyway. Um, so we have our crown, truth mask, some data set, blah, 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 bounding box. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. He uses bounding box prompt. Then prepares everything. So here he takes the same with base model, right? So the original one from Facebook, basically and uses this same data set here so it looks like he is using yeah so he's using box prompts right uh, as before i guess he created these box prompts um from the ground truth masks with some some noise to it so when you have your your data set and you, you do have some crown truth mask already you can just create this bounding box around this mask like you did before so it's the same here right some some noise to it and then use these boxes um yeah as a prompt basically for sam to find unit as far as i can see here that's what's happening okay thanks yeah no problem <laughs> Okay. Any more questions? If not, that is it. And thank you for attending and have a good day or night or whatever time it is at your place. <laughs>